Greetings in Jesus' name. I wish that I could be with you today. I wish I could have been hanging out all day in town for Heritage Day, Saturday. But my family is sick. We have COVID. <laughs> We're doing okay. <clears throat> you can maybe tell I've got a bit of a scratchy voice and a bit of a cough today. But we're on the mend. The kids are pretty much feeling themselves again, and Leanna and I are starting to recover. So appreciate your prayers, and we ought to be back again this upcoming Sunday, since by then all of our quarantine periods will be over. Our sermon text for today is from Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 through 46 and we'll be reading the text uh, throughout the sermon today. Sometimes jobs like dishes or laundry or weeding in the garden or picking up after toddlers or keeping your truck in good repair feel like an exercise in futility. The moment you wash the dishes there are more dirty ones. The moment you think you've got all the weeds, or all the toys picked up, there's another one. The moment you're done fixing the catalytic converter, there's a leak in the fuel line. You might ask yourself, why do I even bother with this? It'll never be done. Is this work worth anything anyway? And maybe you don't ask yourself that. Perhaps you recognize that what you do matters, whether it's big or small, whether it stays done or not. But why? Why does it matter? It's actually a big question in our time. Many people find a lot of freedom in the line, it doesn't matter. They do all sorts of evil things, as if they will be able to escape the consequences by denying them. But if I can do whatever I want, and it doesn't matter, that applies both to deviant freedom and to the important things in life. If I can gossip and it doesn't matter, if I can be sexually immoral and it doesn't matter, if I can use God's name in vain and it doesn't matter, then you know what? Then all my accomplishments at school or at work don't matter either. All the money I'm making doesn't matter. All the good things I've done don't matter. And that is a path to despair. Our text for today tells us very clearly that everything we do matters. And it tells us why. Jesus is coming back. And at his return he will judge everyone according to what they have done and demand an account, whether it was good or bad. What you do matters, because Jesus will remember all of it before his judgment throne. So let's begin taking a look at our text. Verses 31 through 33 say, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. This is talking about Jesus' second coming, when he comes in his glory. The angels will come with him, and he shows himself as the conquering king. He comes to judge all the nations. As he sits on his glorious throne, he gathers and he separates. This same scene is depicted a little bit differently for us by the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 20. It's sometimes called the Great White Throne Judgment. In that text, John mentions that the books will be opened, in which God has recorded everything we've ever done, as well as the Lamb's Book of Life, in which the names of every believer are recorded. Here in Matthew 25, some of the elements are literal and some are figurative. There aren't really sheep and goats, they're people. But just as a shepherd in Jesus' day would have separated the sheep from the goats at certain times, so the Good Shepherd separates his sheep, the believers, from the unbelieving goats at the end of the age. 
<clears throat> Verse 34 is very important for us to understand. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This verse is so important because it shows us that even though Jesus is about to mention all the good things that the believers have done, that is not ultimately what saved them. Think of Abraham, to whom God said, I will bless you and make your name great. Abraham didn't earn that blessing. God chose him in love. Hebrews 6.12 says that it is through faith and patience that the saints inherit the promises. And a kingdom prepared for the sheep from before the foundation of the world can't be one that they earned. God made it for them as a gift. It's like a surprise birthday present made or purchased several months in advance, then safely hidden away until just the right time. In other words, verse 34 tells us that Jesus invites his sheep into the eternal kingdom of his Father by grace through faith. He promises to bless them, to give them the last thing, to give them at last the things that the Father had prepared for them from before the very beginning. With this in mind, let's look at verses 34 and thir excuse me, 35 and 36. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. At first glance, it looks like this kind of undermines what we just discussed. It sounds like Jesus is saying, the reason you guys are in the kingdom is because you've done a whole bunch of great stuff. You've done a good job of loving your neighbor as yourself. But the little word for can be used in a few different ways. It can tell us the reason for something, like in the sentence, you need new license plate tabs for your old ones are expired. But it can also cite evidence, like in the sentence, it must have rained yesterday for it is wet outside. In the second sentence there, the wetness didn't cause the rain, it was the other way around. The wetness was evidence that it had rained. And that's the way that the word for is used here in verses 35 and 36. The good works that Christians do to love their neighbor are not the reason they're saved, but those good works do give the world and the Lord evidence to look at, which shows we are saved. Christians work hard to love their neighbors as themselves because God first loved us. Our gratitude to God, our freedom in Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, drive us to love those around us however we can. And when we do, Jesus the Judge can point at those deeds of love and cite them as evidence of our faith at the Last Judgment. In verses 37 through 39, the sheep are puzzled. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you in sick or in prison and visit you? They are no longer called sheep at this point, but their identity as the righteous is clear. But they are puzzled. They don't remember seeing Jesus the King any time when they had the opportunity to help. But Jesus answers their question this way in verse 40. Then the King will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. This is a beautiful thing. When we do something good for someone, Jesus says we've done it to him. Everything you do for everyone, it matters. And not just the big things you do for important people. Those are the things that get attention in the world. To Jesus, even the little things done for the little people matter. Sharing some food or water, sharing some clothes, sharing your house, sharing some time. Jesus honors those things with his special mention here in our text. This is the reason that the text was chosen for this particular Sunday. We're taking a little break from our series through the book of Jeremiah. 
We're taking a special offering today for the Uppsala Helping Hands Fund, which is used to help those in need, often in a small way. We can't fix everyone's problems, and that's not our goal, but we can give a little gas to the traveler, or some groceries to the hungry, or give a little lift to someone in a tight spot. But that's only one of a thousand ways that we can love our neighbor. A lot of the time, loving the people around us, for Jesus' sake, looks pretty ordinary. It means taking care of our families, doing our jobs well, giving for the cause of his kingdom, and other rather ordinary things. Occasionally, though, an opportunity to take care of someone that we don't know well, and in an unusual way, just falls into our lap. May the Holy Spirit prepare us to take advantage of those opportunities. The Good Samaritan was minding his own business, so to speak, when he came across the traveler, beaten and lonely on the side of the road. He could have said to himself, I don't know that guy, let somebody else take care of him. But he didn't. <clears throat> Instead, he went out of his way for this stranger because of his compassion. God help us to do the same. Paul tells us in Galatians 6.10, so then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. In doing good deeds, we should take special care of our fellow Christians, but not neglect to care for unbelievers also. To summarize where we've been so far, in our text Jesus is talking about his second coming as the conquering king and sovereign judge. He will gather the whole population of the world from all of history together before his throne and separate the sheep from the goats, the righteous from the unrighteous. The righteous at his right hand he will welcome with words of blessing that remind us that we're saved by grace alone through faith alone. But he also cites as evidence of their faith the good things that they've done for their neighbor. Whether big or small actions to important or insignificant people makes no difference. Everything they did mattered, because whatever they did for their fellow man, they did for Jesus himself. In verse 41, the king turns his attention to the unrighteous goats. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. <coughs> Excuse me. We learn a couple of things from this. First of all, the fire of punishment for the unrighteous is eternal. It does not end. And that is the most horrifying thing about it. Almost anything can be endured for a short time, but the, to endure the torment of fire without end, without hope, that is truly terrifying. Second, this unrighteous, this fire of torment was not originally prepared for the unrighteous men. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. They are the proper recipients of this punishment, but now the unrighteous men must also join them. Why? The judge continues in verses 42 and 43. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Here we should observe a few more things. First of all, in fancy terms, these are called sins of omission. Rather than saying, you guys committed murder and adultery and blasphemy, you lied and stole and worshipped idols, etc., mentioning things that they did that were wrong, Jesus mentioning, mentions things they did not do, things they forgot about, neglected, things they could have done but didn't. They had jobs to do, people to care for, opportunities to show compassion, and they didn't care. They let them slip by and spent their days enslaved to sin, serving themselves, probably even stepping on the least of these my brothers in the process. Second, these guys earned have earned what they are about to get from the righteous judge. 
Sometimes we just toss around that phrase, it doesn't matter, without thinking. Actually, these things matter a whole lot more than we think they do. And faith in Jesus matters as much more as, than everything else combined as the sky is higher than the grass. What we do for others, or what we neglect to do for others, matters for eternity. So much so that for their neglect, j the judge is about to cast these goats into the fire of hell that will not end. They try to dodge his accusation, but he doesn't fall for it, in verses 44 and 45. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked or sick or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. <coughs> Excuse me. They think that because they did not see the king in person, they can be excused for their neglect. But Jesus knows their heart, and their excuses make no difference. Verse 46, therefore, summarizes in so brief a fashion, something so enormous it is hard to comprehend. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Note what is the same. Both the punishment and the life are eternal. They do not end. But what a contrast. Punishment and life are so different. That is the difference, dear friends, that faith in Jesus makes. It is with that in mind I want to appeal to you in one more way. If we need food and water, lest our bodies die, how much more do we need the bread of life and the water of life to live forever? If it is good to share food and water with our neighbor, Surely it is also good for us to share Jesus with our neighbor, because their fate without Jesus is much worse than their fate without bread. We will go about this in different ways as different individuals, and even when opportunities are scarce, we must always pray that God would spare the lives of unbelievers around us long enough for them to repent. Jesus, the righteous judge, is coming. And when he arrives, he will separate the sheep from the goats. I pray that all of you would be found among his sheep at his coming. Amen.